I'm just going to start um, while people are still coming in and before the doors open because I know um, we are short of time. We've got five fantastic speakers here for this session. And if I just work out the um, technology, I'm better at speaking than technology. And you're in the um, carer training and support session. If you don't want to be in this session, you have time to move to the next one, but I can tell you this is going to be a fantastic session. <laughs> As I say, we have five fantastic speakers here. Thank you all for coming here because, um, as most of you know, I'm the wife of Chris Roberts, so um, carers and the training uh, to and for carers is massively close to my heart. If we don't manage to um, have the support necessary, how can we support our person living with dementia? If my person living with dementia is doing well, I am more likely to do well. I need the skills and the services need to enable me with the skills and the support for me to continue with that caring role. Now our first speaker, I hope, is Maud, Maud Demon. Is that how we pronounce it? Uh, yeah, I can go first, I think. Yeah. I, it, I can go. Yes, if you go first, please, if that's okay. It's just that that's the one I've got on my list here. <laughs> I was the third, so maybe it's a presentation. I don't know if it's in the right order, but... Okay. Um, yeah, if we can try yours. If it's not your... We'll see which presentation comes up, and then whoever chooses that presentation can begin the, the, their presentation. <laughs> Okay, is that? <laughs> okay, so, and your name is? <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. Yeah. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Eileen Harkis Murphy. I am a lecturer in the University of the West of Scotland, and I also have the pleasure of being part of a wonderful team entitled Alzheimer's Scotland Centre for Policy and Practice. And Dr Eileen is a psychologist who has expertise in the practice and research in the area of health improvement, mental health and well-being. She has an interest in psychological trauma and how trauma-informed approaches can mit mitigate risk of re-traumatisation for carers uh, and people with dementia. And she has expertise in quantitative methodologies medical statistics and inferential data analysis. And I understood most of that, but the inferential data is a bit beyond me, but thank you. Lovely, thanks very much. So my presentation today is entitled Triple Jeopardy. I really want to present to you the outcomes of this co-produced learning project carried out in a setting that was really unusual both for the care of older people and for those living with dementia. A high secure mental health service is provided for those people who are legally detained in a hospital due to a mental disorder. And for years, this tended to be a population who were younger to middle-aged. And dementia was quite rare in that setting. However, as we all know, we have an ageing population and that population is ageing everywhere. So as this population ages, we have a higher risk of dementia and that creates the triple jeopardy of care where we have long-term mental health problems, an ageing process and dementia. So we reviewed the literature within this area and we found very little about this topic. And we have not located any evaluation of learning opportunities in the setting about dementia. So this created an exciting gap. And this was a gap that was identified by, as a practice need by the practitioners working within the setting. This was very much a co-produced, co-developed project where we had the planning for the outcomes and the structure of the program was co-developed by the expert forensic mental health practitioners and academics who were expert in dementia care. It is the first co-produced learning project about dementia 
with staff in a high secure mental health setting in Scotland. And we really wanted to understand how this learning process impacted on practice, and that is what I'm going to tell you about now. So a quick word about the process and the project. It was, there was 20 staff from one unit attended intensive hybrid learning sessions in small groups. They, and we used our care empathia approach. This is a signature approach that is based on sound educational principles that effectively using how we think, how we feel and how we behave. So that is our cognition our effective component and our practice element. And that was a really important aspect that underpinned the learning approach. And this was supported by an academic who was on site during this process. So to evaluate the attitudes and the learning from the sessions, we used two rating scales before and after the learning sessions. And these aligned closely with the outcomes of the evaluation. What we wanted to do was to find out and to understand if there was a change in attitude around dementia and a change in knowledge around dementia. So we used the attitudes to dementia scale and the knowledge in dementia scale. And six weeks later, we ran two focus groups and that gathered in-depth information from the staff that allowed us to get a better understanding of the longer term impact on practice. So some of the findings were quite mixed. For the attitudes about dementia, there was no significant change However, this scale has two subscales, which means there's two parts to it and it measures different things. So we ran the analysis on these and we found a significant difference in the attitude to in the attitudes to dementia scale on the subscale of personhood. So this means that staff attitudes to dementia linked with the dimension of recognition of personhood were significantly higher following the training. And personhood is an aspect, it's, it's described as a, a standing or a status that's bestowed upon an individual by another, and it's seen as crucial and a positive aspect within person-centered care. So that was a really positive finding. So when we understand these results, it's essential that we highlight a couple of important points. When we looked at the baseline scores, that was a really good indication about a starting point. So that's the pre-test score that participants had scored before they took part in the learning. And these generally showed that staff had a positive attitude towards dementia prior to taking part in the sessions with scores towards the high end of the scale. But this would be kind of generally expected given their profession. Also, importantly, which is a, a gap and uh, something that we are looking at as a team, and that is that the dating scale was developed before the current culture of positive attitudes towards dementia. So there really is a need there to update these scales and to develop scales that reflect the current education and practice. In terms of the learning, Overall, we found there was a significant increase in practitioners' self-reported knowledge about dementia. Overall, we concluded that the training was effective in improving knowledge and attitudes towards dementia. And that change was found to be statistically significant on both dimensions. So that was a really positive um, outcome. So the findings from the focus groups that were carried out six weeks later, are expressed here within three themes. The first was the change in the way we, the, the practitioners saw their practice and how they felt validated by the learning. So the first quote here is, you might have been doing things with the best of intentions, 
but might not have been the right thing to be doing. But I think now you do have that better knowledge of what you're doing. Now, this really reflects for us that sense of empowerment as staff uh, practiced with confidence, and this was facilitated by their, their learning sessions. In terms of their attitudes, staff considered themselves and their managers as person-centered, and there was a clear shift created by that general greater knowledge and insight. Their approach moved from managing situations to actively engaging through understanding and responding with empathy. In terms of communication, I'm going to read the quote again, and that is, I used to always think the closer you were to someone, the better, but realise now you need to take a step back and, like, meet his eye. Make sure he is actually paying attention. Just all that. Just everything really is an easier day. So this, this really reflected the, the development of communication skills for the staff. They were also beginning to appreciate this impact on practice, which was wonderful. Their techniques they learned were being recognised as effective, and this creates a feeling of um, empowerment around interpersonal communication. The communication is now calibrated and aligned to the person, and this is proving extremely helpful to the staff and to the people within receiving the care. So finally, for the practice change, I'll read the final quote. I would just say as well, I think it has been a big difference. It impacts on everything. It impacts on him getting showered. We can communicate better. Everybody is doing the same thing. So there's clear indications here that the learning is reflected in the reports from practice and particularly on the daily fundamental care that is provided, the eating, the drinking, the personal care and the safety of moving around, which was really important. So overall, this resulted in an improved care experience for the people with dementia and increased partnership, increased confidence in that partnership of care. And whilst these staff were expert in delivering mental health related care around, many of them e expressed that they weren't experts in dementia and dementia care. So this was a really important development in their confidence and practice that we want to explore further. So moving forward, this application of learning to practice is not perceived as static. And staff are now looking forward to potential needs in the future and preparing where they can meet these changing needs. So yeah, we need to keep communicating the best we can and be mindful of who the person is and the potential barriers. Ongoing analysis of the data we have will converge the data more closely and explore some of the key themes that will help us get a better understanding of what worked well in the project what can be improved and different ways that we can take this forward. This will be, we expect there'll be other learning opportunities and other partnership opportunities that we can take forward um, to explore this in greater detail. Thank you very much for listening today. This is the details of the team and um, we've got a couple of them here today. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Harkis um, Murphy. Um, one of the things that I really took from that, we're going to have questions later, and um, I'm afraid what I didn't tell you was, is you're supposed to have downloaded the app, and the questions will be put through onto the forum. Um, but if we don't get any questions from there, I will take yours later. Um, just for, for those watching, this was the hand raised in the room. Questions will have to come at the end, I'm afraid. Um, but one of the key things I took from that is it's all about communication in whichever way we communicate. And if we get that right, it can make such a difference. So thank you. Our next speaker um, is Noemi Pasquier from 
um, de Haute École de Santé. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. Um, unfortunately, her colleague Sandrine Pihe couldn't be here today. And Noemi will be speaking about how could referral practices contribute to the difficulties of informal care caregivers in finding the right support, the support I support talked about earlier. So thank you, Noemi. Thank you. Thank you. Um, indeed, uh, Sandrine Pierre could, uh, couldn't uh, join us today, but uh, she will uh, follow the conference uh, online, I hope. So um, welcome to all. I'm uh, pleased to present to you today some results on uh, referral practices. Um, with this question in mind, could uh, referral practices contribute to the difficulties of informal caregivers in finding the, the right support? Um, uh, informal caregivers uh, of a person with dementia, then it will, uh, it will, it will be just uh, written ICDs in my uh, presentation and I will speak about caregivers. Um, I, don't, I think I don't have to spell it out for you. They are under pressure, their physical and mental health um, as well as their quality of life are often challenged. Um, they have many and varied needs that are that are difficult to identify. The needs um, can go from um, need for practical support, like uh, such as for transport or care, but also related to spe special uh, skills, like uh, communication with the person with dementia, for example, um, and other aspects, for example, for uh, emotional support to deal with the difficult emotions um, in related to white grief, for example. And despite um, significant unmet needs, caregivers uh, often call for support too late when they are already exhausted or in a crisis situation. And uh, this, uh, the reasons for this could uh, include the difficulties of caregivers in finding the, the adequate support, support services. Um, as the needs of caregivers are many and uh, varied, so are the support um, services. And, uh, it's, that's why we wanted, we wished to address uh, the vast network of um, providers from different fields who support them. The study was uh, conducted in the bilingual uh, French-German canton of Fribourg in, uh, in, in Switzerland. And to find out more about uh, pr providers' referral practices, uh, we conducted two main approaches. Uh, in an online survey, we um, um, asked them to rate um, uh, their practices uh, against uh, 46 needs. These uh, needs items were developed uh, following a uh, literature, systematic literature, literature review from my colleagues uh, Stefanie Kipfer and Sandrine Pillet. Uh, but uh, for today, we focus on the answers that concerns referral and uh, if they refer, then to whom. And we also conducted semi-structured uh, uh, interview to uh, define, uh, to refine our understanding of um, referral strategies. Uh, we are very proud to count on uh, um, the responses of 55 providers. Uh, these people are working in this activity in Median for eight years and they meet between one to uh, more than 100 um, caregivers a year. And we can see in the table that uh, the, the profile are very varied here by profession, but they, but they, they also come from different uh, type, type of uh, institution, uh, organizations, such as in institutions, organ um, associations, but also uh, private uh, services, for example. And uh, eight, uh, 18 of them uh, granted us with an in-depth interview. Here it goes with the, the results. So um, we can see that uh, so, uh, we, um, uh, we learned that referral was really common um, on average across the, all the needs. Uh, half of the providers who would refer uh, caregivers to other providers. This means that as an informal caregiver, when I address a need to, an, to a provider, one out of two times I will be redirected by, to another provider. Um, in median, each provider would refer for 15 needs and with a very uh, large range. So we can see that for some providers, they will not provide referral at all. And other providers, um, who it is probably the function, will refer for all the needs. 
in terms of density of the referral. Um, the comments received on uh, the referral targets show a huge network, a support network, um, and a, a huge density with a, a list of quasi 150 targets. Um, uh, and in median, each provider use 13.5 uh, different targets. Um, there is um, per need in median 10 uh, uh, referral targets. And um, here again with the, uh, um, a large range, and I, I would like to give you some example for the need uh, for help to get more emotional, peop um, emotional support for from people around me. Uh, there was only one target uh, cited, and it was psychologist. And for the need um, uh, for more information about services or organization that could help me in the care of the person with dementia, it was a list of 17 targets, uh, such as uh, Association Alzheimer, but also uh, ProSenectute, which is an associ association for elderly people in uh, Switzerland, um, home care, day care, um, volunteer services, and brochures, etc. And um, we, um, to explore the, the relevance of a um, referral, we look at some responses in detail. We didn't, we didn't uh, do it for uh, systematically, but I would like to give you another example for the need of uh, information, uh, need for information on the diagnosis of uh, the the person with dementia. Here again, we became we became a, a very long list of uh, referral uh, targets. However, is it possible that um, there is a possible mismatch because in our sample, um, the general practitioners and memory clinic who said, ah, we meet this need very well, were only mentioned by less than a half of a participant. Um, in the um, in-depth um, uh, interview, we revealed that uh, the referral strategies are um, based on, so depends on how good the providers knew, know the network and also of, uh, as de it depends on the situation of the caregiver. And um, we saw that um, providers get to know with the network uh, as they go along, so um, whether on the basis of uh, reputation, word of mouth, but also on, uh, of ba on basis of good or bad experiences with uh, another provider, um, and also by uh, working in network. And sometimes it's uh, also just on theoretical knowledge, so uh, maybe they do that, but we, we are not sure of that. And uh, referral according to the, IC, the um, ICD situation is, uh, of course, based on the specific needs, but also um, on what um, support they already know or become. For example, um, when they already know uh, an occupational therapist, maybe it, it could be an option to address this need to this, pe this person they already know and not to um, add another provider um, in the... In the support and um, it depends also on um, characteristics such as geographical or financial situation. A challenge in addition to the difficulty to have up-to-date information is to um, uh, uh, know whether providers offer appropriate support for a situation with dementia what, which is really specific and, um, uh, and there were several um, providers who told me, told me that uh, when they do not know to whom to refer, then they would refer to a support provider who can better refer. And here we come back again with the density of referral um, activities and uh, that asks um, caregivers who are already exhausted or overwhelmed to, uh, to take other steps further to, um, uh, until they uh, be become the right support. Um, before concluding, in a, as a matter of uh, conscience, these uh, results should be taken with caution because it's an exploratory study and uh, with um, qualitative content, which is a challenge to analysis to uh, reliably summarize the information without to lose the richness of the comments. And, um, 
In addition, the survey was particularly long. Here I, I just show a little uh, uh, um, example, but it was long and that explained the, um, why we, became, we, we have become uh, less answer at the end of uh, the survey as uh, at the beginning. Uh, however, the results highlight the diversity and complexity of uh, referral activities, um, and uh, which could contribute to the long and demanding journey of uh, caregivers to, um, uh, to become, to, before finding relevant uh, support options. It seems then es essential to facilitate the navigation, the orientation of uh, um, caregivers within the support network, and um, for example, by providing one single point of contact for informal caregivers of a person uh, with dementia who could assess overall needs to have an overview of the situation and then refer to the um, who, just one single point of contact could would be familiar with the support network and um, its uh, strengths to refer uh, caregivers. So um, thank you for your attention and um, I look forward to answer your questions if you have. Thank you, no Noemi. That was um, really enlightening, but it's, it's the same as what we call it in the UK is the postcode lottery. Where you live depends on the support or the, the, the quality of the services you get. Anyway, I'd like to now ask our next speaker, who is Maud Diemen uh, from the Netherlands. Maud um, is uh, with the Alzheimer's Centre at Limburg, Maastricht University. She's a PhD student at the Alzheimer's Centre. I've just said that. <laughs> and her PhD focuses on e-health support for caregivers and people with a neuro neurodegenerative disorder. Her presentation for the session will focus on the Partner in Balance Programme, a caregiver support programme. So thank you, Maud. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Uh, before I start my presentation, I would like to thank the organisation of the Alzheimer's Europe Conference, uh, for giving me this opportunity to tell you something about the research I'm involved in. So thank you very much for that. Um, as you can see on the screen, my presentation for today will focus on the Partner and Balance program, which is an online self-management program for caregivers of people with a neurodegenerative uh, disorder. And before I'll go into detail about this program, I would like to say a few words about my own background. And I think the next slide. Yeah. So my name is Maud Dame. I'm a PhD student indeed at the Alzheimer's Center Limburg, which is part uh, of Maastricht University in the Netherlands. And my PhD focuses on developing e-health support for caregivers of people with a neurodegenerative disorder. And specifically, I focus on dementia, Parkinson's disease, and also Huntington's disease. And for those of you who are not familiar with Huntington's disease, uh, it is a hereditary neurodegenerative disorder. So it is passed on from a parent uh, to a child and it results in uncontrollable movements and also cognitive decline uh, and psychiatric symptoms. In the upcoming minutes, I will tell you more about what the Partner in Balance program entails and how we adapt the program for multiple target groups. But first, what is Partner in Balance? Partner in Balance is an online training for family caregivers. And the program supports caregivers in coping with their situation, the associated changes, challenges, uh, and to make sure they still maintain their own uh, activities and still meet their own needs. So they can keep, continue to, to keep that balance in daily life. And as I said at the beginning, it's a self-management program. So when a caregiver follows the program, they are in control when following the program. It's not the case that they lean back, uh, receive all the information. They really have to actively participate. Uh, and it's about the empowerment of the caregiver. Uh, they are guided by a personal coach, which is a trained healthcare professional. And they can choose between a range of modules that cover a variety of topics uh, within the program but I will tell you more about the role of the healthcare professional and the modules uh, later in this presentation. For who did we develop the program? So we originally developed the program for caregivers of people with dementia, 
But self-management programs like these that are aimed at increased control and empowerment of the caregiver could be beneficial for other caregivers of uh, families with a neurodegenerative disorder as well. And of course, differences exist, but many consequences for family caregivers uh, occur with multiple neurodegenerative disorders. Um, so based on that and the results that we received from a clinical trial that we did on the original uh, part and balance program on dementia, uh, which the results were aimed at an increased level of control, uh, mastery, and quality of life. Um, and the questions we got from clinical practice, so we got also the questions from the caregivers themselves to adapt the program. We decided to develop the program and tailor it to young onset dementia, Parkinson's disease, frontotemporal dementia, and also Huntington's disease. And I will take this last version as an example uh, to take you through the development of the program and how we adapted the program to their needs. There is this base and platform from the uh, already existing versions uh, of the Partner and Balance program that we could build upon. So that was really helpful. But uh, for the Huntington version and also for the other versions, we looked at existing literature about what do we already know about their needs of the caregivers. We also received input from experts in the field, so they reviewed uh, the content and they provided uh, feedback, which was really valuable, but I think what we valued most, and I would also call them the real experts in the field, are the caregivers themselves. And that's what we really wanted to put a focus on, on the real life experiences of these caregivers. Uh, and we did that by organizing focus groups with family caregivers. So we really wanted to explore uh, their needs, their real life experiences, and we wanted to ask them, what would you want to see in such a support program? And unfortunately, I can't go into detail right now about all the topics and all the themes that emerged during these focus groups. Uh, but I can show you the themes that turned into modules for the Partner and Balance program. And you can see them right here on the screen. And on the left side, you can see the modules that are also in the existing uh, Partner and Balance program. That we also adapted for uh, the Huntington version. And you can see that these are independent, or mostly independent by the type of disease, but based on principles of self-management. Uh, and that's what also make this a suitable base to, to build upon and to adapt it to multiple target groups. Uh, we analyzed the focus groups, like I just said, and of course also new themes emerged. And those modules you can see on the right, because we also uh, made modules on those topics. And that's what caregivers said, that they really think it would be helpful to also receive a module on those topics. So about the pre-diagnostic phase, a nursing home admission, and a future concerns. And what if a caregiver wants to follow the program? What does a module entail? Uh, this is the procedure. So first, between the coach and the healthcare professional, uh, a starting meeting is planned. And the modules are being picked that they want to follow within the program. Uh, and it matches their personal situation and it they would want to work on or know, know more information about. And it doesn't matter which module they choose because each model is structured in the same way. So each module starts with a video, and we uh, conducted video interviews with the caregivers. So we interviewed them, and they talked about their situation, what they encounter in daily life, how they cope with that, and if they have tips for other caregivers as well. Uh, so we made a video about that. After the video, they read the background information, and within the background information, uh, there are always the, the personal stories of people, we share personal stories of people. Uh, there's psychoeducation, so the informational part uh, within the module. And each background information always ends with tips that are made by and for the caregivers that we derived from the focus groups. And after they receive the information, so they first uh, look at the video, they read the text, then they fill in a reflective assignment and a five-step action plan. And that is to gain insight into their own situation and reflect on their own situation. What do I encounter in daily life? Or what do I want to work on? Or what do I have trouble with? Uh, that's what they fill in in the reflective assignment. And with a five-step action plan, they, they work towards a personal goal. 
and they won't have to do it on their own because they are guided by this healthcare professional that I talked about at the beginning. Uh, and this healthcare professional guides them throughout the program, uh, is there for any questions, but also provides feedback to them on their, uh, on their assignments. And a healthcare professional makes sure that these, this personal goal is, is concrete and achievable, which is of course really important. And the fact that we included this healthcare professional is a conscious choice because that's an explicit wish that was made by the caregivers. They preferred this online program, which they could consult at a time and a place that is convenient for them. But they explicitly said they also wanted a personal element within the program. So that's why we chose to include this healthcare professional uh, as well. So this is what the procedure looks like. Uh, so first, the starting meeting. After that, they follow the different modules. And at the end, they plan an evaluation meeting. So between the coach and uh, the caregiver. So they evaluate what they think of the program, how they experience the program, uh, what they learn from it, but also what they take towards the future. To finalize, um, this year we uh, finalized the Huntington Partner and Balance program. So our aim of the program is to support these caregivers, to increase their resilience uh, so that they're able to keep to continue to care for their loved one uh, and hopefully reduce overburdening at a later stage. And at this moment we are piloting uh, this program uh, to see what the first evaluation is and what the preliminary results are. Uh, but at this point, limited uh, support is developed for caregivers of people with uh, Huntington disease as a self-management program. So it enables us to explore what the possibilities are of developing and using uh, transdiagnostic support. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much. That was really interesting. Um, I'm going to ask you all to bear with me. We're running out of time, but if you stay with me and, and listen to my last two speakers, I'll buy you a glass of wine shortly. <laughs> <laughs> if I can ask Bryony to take to the podium. Um, Bryony's in her final year as a PhD student, and I don't know if any of you know how hard it is to be a PhD student. Um, and she's created a UK version of the person attuned musical interaction, PAM intervention that promotes two-way interactions between care staff and residents with dementia. Pam, if you can be as quick as you can, but don't rush. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so today I'm going to talk about the Person Attuned Musical Interaction, or PAMI, and this is a care home um, training tool to improve interactions between care staff and residents with dementia. So many individuals with dementia live in care homes, and as they require additional support with completing daily activities, and this means that a relationship built on trust and respect is really vital to make sure that the residents get the care and the respect that they deserve. But unfortunately, many care home interactions are insufficient. They've been um, reported as being infrequent, short, fragmented, and generally task oriented where they focus on the kind of task at hand rather than discussing leisure. Um, individuals with Dementia can experience a reduction in kind of verbal language, and this can make interactions harder. But they do still have a range of other communication skills they can use, including nonverbal communication. And the main reason staff say that interactions are limited in care homes is because of staff time. So music has also been highlighted as a potential um, form of communication that works really effectively as the processing of music can consist throughout the stage of dementia. So care home music interventions have um, a multi-beneficial for both the residents and care staff and I've just highlighted some of the benefits on my slide. So there's generally two types of music interventions that are used. We have music therapy which is supplied by a qualified music therapist or music activities, which is a bit more flexible and can be facilitated by staff, volunteers, musicians, or external organisations. But both have their limitations. For music therapy, there is an issue around um, the limited amount of music therapists. In the UK, there's only about 250 music therapists in the dementia field. And many care homes can't afford the costs of music therapy. 
Music activities are more accessible as they can be supplied by anyone, but again, there's issues around funding and staff available time. Um, so music therapies have started offering skill sharing um, training, and this is where we provide where music therapists provide um, music therapy skills to staff to incorporate. But again, this is obviously only available to the care homes that have a music therapist employed. So PAMI aims to be a staff training tool that can provide some of those music um, therapy skills through a manual to make it a bit more accessible. So it was originally developed in Denmark and in the Danish manual, the PAMI team trained the music therapists who then go out to care homes and train the care staff. My PhD project aims to develop a UK version of PAMI that's culturally appropriate. And one of the changes we had to make was remove the music therapist. As I suggested, there's not a lot of music therapists in the UK, um, so it wasn't really making it that much more accessible. So we did this by having a PAMI team that included two music therapists that developed the manual, which we then delivered um, into care homes directly. Um, so another change we had to make was because of COVID, we converted it to an online training session. And this consisted of one interactive webinar and then fortnightly reflective sessions with a music therapist, which was slightly different to the Danish one that did hands-on um, kind of supervision. Uh, the manual consists of five sections. We have the voice. So this explores... The musical elements within our voice, such as tempo, volume, timbre, and how we can adapt those musical elements um, to change our interactions. Framing looks at adapting the environment, so using music to create security and predictability, and a sound environment that is suitable for interactions. In this element, we also look at music to cue to orientate an individual to a task or a person or a time. Balancing looks at using appropriate music to balance um, residents' arousal and their emotions to make sure that we try and keep a more natural and neutral um, arousal state where interactions can occur more naturally. And we also look at the staff members' arousal and how they can balance that so they're not going into the interaction stressed. We have connecting. This looks at using meaningful music that will allow for conversations to occur more naturally and to help reminisce. And in this stage, we get each staff member to create a PAMI music plan to make sure that the intervention is tailored to the individual, um, as we've heard in a lot of talks today. Each person with dementia is a different individual, and we need to work to make sure that the skills are beneficial for them. And then we have a practical guideline on how to incorporate the music intervention, um, appropriateness of music to use, and just to kind of help staff to understand how they can implement it successfully. Once we adapted the manual, we did a qualitative field testing study with three care homes in Lincolnshire in the UK. And we aimed to recruit nine participants, so nine staff and nine residents. We ended up with five pairs fully completing the study. They implemented PAMI for 10 weeks, and this consisted of one training session and three reflective sessions. Um, so from the data we collected, seven themes emerged. As I'm limited on time today, I'll only touch on a few. So we have the staff experience. Staff found a change in their mood, and this could have been as a result of the change in the residents' behavior. They experienced reduced stress, but an increase in confidence. They were more confident in going around um, singing, which they didn't have feel they could do before. They felt a sense of pride of being able to change their resident's experience and seeing that what they were doing was benefiting their resident. They felt a sense of pride that they were able to do that. They found how they could use music for coping mechanisms. So many of them used the music to kind of help them when residents were being aggressive to help them kind of understand why the resident was being like that and not kind of get stressed or agitated at the resident themselves. And they gained awareness of their voice and sound environment. And many of them actively changed 
active, made active changes to the sound environment and their voice to improve their residents' experience. Residents' response, again, they were, had an increased mood. They were happier, more content, and relaxed. When balancing was used, residents' arousal levels led to fewer agitation instances. And when agitation did occur, staff were able to manage that a lot quicker. We saw increased participation in interactions and activities, as well as increasement in awareness and attention. During personal care, when music was used, there was an improvement in task efficiency, with the experience being more pleasant for both the resident and the staff member. The, um, when music was used during mealtimes, we saw an increase in food consumption. Um, we also saw that there was an improvement in the overall care home practice. Um, so all of the staff attempted to include PAMI into their routines. Um, they used more appropriate music in care homes and other residents got involved, not just the ones that were in the study. And they felt that the home was brought alive. The main aim of PAMI was to improve two-way attuned musical interactions and we did see an improvement in interactions. Residents had improved verbal and nonverbal communication, and staff just demonstrated attuned interactions where they were able to attend to their residents' needs and understand the communication kit. And I will stop there. <laughs> How many more slides do you have? There's um, a few, so I'll Can you just go straight to a quick conclusion? conclusion? Yeah. Um, so in conclusion, using PAMI is a trial and error training tool that requires staff to experiment to find the skills that works for their resident. Um, as I said, we had to make it online as due to COVID, and this shows that it is plausible to provide PAMI remotely. But having the remote format makes it difficult to determine exactly what the staff were doing. Is it PAMI or was it just activities and how high quality were they? This is the first study investigating PAMI UK, so more research is needed. And we're currently um, running our second study now. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about the whistle stop for you. Our next speaker is Francesca Neviani, um, University. I shall let her explain the university. Um, she's a, uh, an Italian geriatrician who works in acute geriatric care in uh, a hospital local to her in Modena in the north of Italy. And her interest is on dementia and delirium, and her objective is to turn her unit into a dementia friendly ward. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to give me the opportunity to share with you our experience uh, in the best practice dementia care learning program designed for healthcare staff working in hospital. So yes, I am a geriatrician and I work in acute uh, uh, geriatric unit and uh, I would like to, to work in a dementia friendly hospital because uh, oh. Uh, because, uh, uh, as you know, uh, hospitalization for people living with dementia can be a terrifying experience because it requires high, very high adaptation cap capabilities and stopping the, the daily routine. Increase the risk of delirium, disability, mortality, and uh, increase the caregiver's burden. In few words, it's a very very and extremely stressing experience. But uh, too often we accept it because it's the natural consequence of uh, the cure of uh, acute illness. It's normal, it's not a problem, and it's not correct. So hospital staff and the people living with dementia live together in a sort of vicious cycle that increase people living with dementia's behavioral expression of unmet needs and discomfort, and the staff's frustration, sense of, of helplessness and hunger. In order to break this uh, vicious cycle, Italian national dementia strategy requires to train healthcare staff also in hospital. And, uh, in our roadmap, to become a dementia-friendly hospital, training is the most important step. We have started to train our staff with the best 
this dementia care learning program developed by uh, university, Stirling University, and the translate in Italian by H Care for Casargento, which is a Stirling University's partner. The content is based on Kitwood person-centered care, focusing on the needs of a person receiving care in hospital setting. The method applied is reflective practice based on a Gibbs reflective cycle. The participants, by the meeting regularly, are engaged to discuss their experiences and engaged to reflect, applying the new knowledge to consider how they might change in practice is delivered in workplace by an internal facilitator, and it's very important because only internal um, workers are, are, uh, are able to, to talk the same language with other uh, health staff, uh, healthcare staff. And, um, and uh, uh, the program provides eight staff meetings to discuss experience for a total of 24 hours and uh, s about seven hours monthly of uh, individual study and, reflex and reflexive practice and the final exam. The aim of this study was to evaluate effectiveness of the program in terms of uh, improved but in change skills and change in practice in order to increase quality of care and the patient and the people with dementia well-being. In this, uh, this is a prospective open court study. The study included 36 course participants, 12 doctors, 8 carers, and 16 nurses working in acute geriatric ward. The training was performed from September to December 2021. The workers were evaluated before and after the program in order to analyze the learning. We have also analyzed the, difference, the differences in care, in care practice before and after the training. Unfortunately, the COVID pandemic caused some problems, uh, I think, everywhere, but uh, also in our unit. And so um, we have uh, stopped, uh, in, in some cases, the observation uh, because of a change in care management due to the necessity uh, of um, uh, people isolation. So we can share only the results of the first observation at three months. The evaluation includes the feedback questionnaires, reflective exercise, dementia attitude scale, caregiver difficulty scale, to analyze competence and knowledge upgrade. To assess the increase of care quality, we evaluated some specific um, point in, uh, in uh, malpractice, just like use of restraints, uh, incident delirium, but also false, and also um, the uh, use, or better, the abuse of antipsychotics. We evaluated 32 people living with dementia in a, in a, um, before the program, and uh, uh, 41 people living with dementia after three months. So, unfortunately, the requirement after six months is going on. The preliminary data show a significant differences between the score obtained on the dementia attitude scale before and after the course, especially for the comfort subscale relating to emotional aspects in people living with dementia care, respect than a general knowledge increase. We have observed an average increase of five points in score. There was also a significant difference between the score obtaining care difficulty scale before and after the training. And the analysis of malpractice indicators show that after the training, there was a significant decrease in use of antipsychotics, in incident delirium, and also in pharmacological restraint, I mean in sedation. 
Despite the limitation linked to the small size of the sample, preliminary data show how general knowledge about dementia seems to be less affected by training, while empathy and emotional aspects related to assistance seem to mostly benefit, and I think it's a very good point. In fact, reflective practice and learning behavior strategies promote a change of attitude in assistance. In this slide, you can see some of the uh, creative solutions that uh, uh, the, my staff um, perform uh, in order to, um, to reduce unmet needs uh, for people living with dementia in our unit. So you can see we create, uh, they create a um, bus stop for, uh, um, for a man that, uh, uh, they, that wanted to, to come back at home, uh, but uh, unfortunately he can't because uh, he, he had a pneumonia and so <laughs> we have to try to treat, uh, to treat uh, he, him. And uh, so he, he look uh, at the bus stop and uh, stop his wandering and wait for the bus and uh, we can do the antib antibiotic. And so you, you can see we have a mobile Lodlan uh, to relax uh, people living with dementia uh, in, uh, in delirium or with acute uh, uh, symptoms. And also we do some activities in order to, um, to occupy uh, our, our patients because we have to uh, use uh, drugs because uh, we are, we highly, I work in an acute hospital and so uh, we have people with sepsis, with uh, uh, heart failure, with pneumonia and uh, we can't, uh, we, we have to use uh, also drugs and so uh, we occupied them uh, during the, uh, the venous uh, administration, for example, infusion. And uh, so there is... <laughs> That's all. <laughs> Thank you. Well, thank you so much for my speakers. Um, the, the, the biggest highlight for me is how if we get the correct communication, if we upskill people in taking um, responsibility themselves, giving people the tools in all walks, on the wards um, and down to, to people like me living on the ground. What a difference we can make to everybody's lives. Not just the people with it in, living with dementia, the carers, but also all the people that are trying to help um, us to continue living life um, as well as we can. We've had two questions online which I've had answered, that was the flurry. I'm going to take the question from this lady, first of all, if anybody does have any questions, put your hands up now. I'm sure my panel will uh, graciously answer them for us. But Karen first, because hers was the first question. Um, you talked at the very beginning about trauma, um, and I wondered, um, you, you know, I, I, f I find that there's a, people in forensic services, but also people generally in mental health services, uh, there's a high level of trauma. And I've also noticed in early dementia as well that when I've interviewed people, there's a high level of, of, of trauma in the background. And I wondered if your, your um, training looked at that sometimes the behaviours we're seeing, um, or, you know, maybe um, I can remember from my own days as a very early nurse, I would go to take somebody's knickers down to go to the toilet, and I probably didn't explain properly and they'd slap you or do something but actually if they've been the uh, uh you know had childhood sexual abuse of course they're going to react to that and i just i was wondering how much of that was involved in your research and secondly um i'm trying to write a, pa a pamphlet for family members um uh i i am one uh, where trauma is an issue um to to, to reflect and think about you know, when is, when is this affecting how I see that person, you know, or what they're doing? Is that because of dementia or is that because of the underlying trauma that they've had in, in the past? And, uh, you know, and, uh, and, I, and, you know, I think as somebody's own ability to stay present 
with what has happened in the past and uh, uh, leaves them. I, I'm, I'm worried that more and more um, things that we might call behaviours will come to the throne. Well, actually, they're just trying to communicate their distress. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Thanks very much. Yes, I'm extremely passionate about um, trauma-informed approaches and care, and I feel that it's an important way that we, we should actually come at understanding people in general, not just um, people living with dementia and their families who most definitely have experienced um, significant adversity, but I, I think it's a, a way to reframe how we understand how we communicate with people, how we, understand, how we engage with people, and that is through a trauma-informed lens, so that we are sensitive to the trauma that people may have experienced. And I think that um, we, we have actually been doing some research, and we've been doing some early research in trauma-informed approaches in dementia, and we're really I'm extremely passionate. I've got a team behind me who are amazing. We want to take that forward, and we are looking at um, funding opportunities to develop that further. It's extremely important. We know it's best practice, and there's so much more that needs to be done um, within that field to understand better ways of working with people. Um, so, Brilliant. I'm, I live in Scotland. Can I get your email out? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I'm to. going to take one last question. And um, thank you so much to, to the lady that put her hand up. Thank you so much for waiting here. Um, I promise you all a glass of wine outside. Uh, is about the partner imbalance. Is just only for family members, family cares, or, or carers can assess it? Professional carers could assess. The program is indeed aimed at. Oh, sorry. The program is indeed aimed at the family uh, caregivers, but that could be partners, that could be brothers, sisters, uh, children uh, of people with dementia. So family caregivers in a in a broad sentence. Yeah. Sorry? No, no, those are the coaches within the program, yeah. Thank you all so much for your time and attention. It's a massively important topic. Uh, I am going to reiterate how fantastic it was to see you all upskilling us in giving us the, the, the skills and the resilience that we need to continue our caring role. I love your award. I'm going to have a chat with you about award we've got in the UK. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for listening, for your interaction. You know their faces. You have their names in the book. If you'd like to ask some questions, I'm sure they'll be far more talkative over a glass of wine. Thank you for being here. And <laughs> <laughs>